Uh, I'd like to thank Nuffield and AWI. AAWI is one of the sponsors, obviously, for this session, but I'm not obligated to do this. I did Nuffield about eight or ten years ago now, eight years ago, and I was actually sponsored by AWI, so I'm thinking maybe they still might be getting a bit of um, their money back eight years on. <laughs> it just gave me a, an opportunity to go away, get out of my farming business for 16 weeks and rejig, and it really was a U-turn in, in how I approached breeding and managing sheep and things. Um, my topic's innovation to ensure the Merino's long-term viability. Uh, I, I'm certainly not a crisis zone or anything like that yet, but we saw with those trends, with those Merino ewes um, that Jason put up there, that we're certainly losing market share. It's a bit of a concern, and she's a great product, and she's a great risk management tool, so we just need to probably redesign her a little bit to make her better. Now, before I go into the nitty-gritty, Jason just alluded to it. I really like this visual here, and I use it in a lot of the talks that I do. We've got four pillars. We've got the genotype, the phenotype, the management, and the environment. That's them. It's not one of them. You try and make that nice big profit roof up there on one or two of them. Jason uh, talked about backing their ass into corners or something, not very eloquently, but having that sort of blue, I guarantee this is not about the geneticists. And you'll put the genetics, and I used to be one of these 10 years ago, I'd say it's all about the genes. It's all about this measurement and stuff. And then I'd go to the show ring and they'd say it's all about the phenotype. It's exactly the way it looks. Forget about all that stuff. That's what it's about. And then you'd talk to an agent or half the blokes at the pub and say it's nothing to do with any of that. It's just what goes down their throats. You know, so there's all this thing. It's a combination of all these things. And it's four pillars of equal value. So I don't even have this debate in industry anymore about what's that about. They need to be strong. You need to work on each of them to have that good profit thing. And the better you work on them and the more you rejig them, the bigger uh, profit they can support. Now, the other end of the deal is a bit of a foundation, production versus fitness. Uh, this is a, a concept, I guess, and I like to put it across there because it's the foundation for just about everything that we do in our breeding programs and things. And it's just a, a matter of sort of understanding. It's the foundation of a house, or in this case, you know, that whole profit sort of system there and that foundation, unless you've got an understanding about that, unless you do, it's like building a house. You can build the beautiful, most unbelievable two or three bed uh, storied house and things, but if that slab's wrong, you're in a world of pain. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on this concept of production versus fitness. If you want a definition of fitness, nothing like the Oxford Dictionary. There's no debate in it then, so that's good. So Oxford Dictionary, fitness, the ability to survive, grow and reproduce in a particular environment. Particularly that reproduce part of that's pretty important. But obviously to live, to grow, to do these things, it's a lot of the stuff that Jason talked on. Um, this was old. This is a, probably should have nearly updated this slide. It seems extremes of production. Well, you can take out it seems because I'm just convinced it's a fact. Extremes of production impact negatively with fitness. It's across all species. This is not something that's unique to Merino or something like that. It's across all species and it's just a fact of life. You look at meat boards, I'll touch on a couple of them. You can make them grow like you wouldn't believe, but their legs will collapse. There's hundreds of examples. Uh, with Merino sheep, the problem seems to be wool cut per head. Um, it's obviously a big profit driver. It's something that we've focused on for 150 years. There's no criticism that that's the way we've gone because that's a profit drive. It makes more sense. If that's what you're selling, that's your product. There's, let's try and get more on the animal. There's, um, once again, we love a bit of science and things in the sense that when I did Nuffield, I went to South Africa and spoke to geneticists there. there was, in all their database, there was a bit of a negative correlation between those two things, number of lambs weaned and greasy fleece weight, or clean fleece weight. Um, number of lambs weaned obviously being a good indicator of fitness, that ability to reproduce. So Argentina, the same deal, the sheep genetics database here, there's that negative correlation. It varies, but it's always that little bit negative. The good news is that's not too scary to sort of deal with. So just very briefly, a couple of um, research, and there's a lot more sort of depth to this, but with time. Uh, one that was done in Australia in the late 1990s or so in the early 2000s. They just got the split of mob of ewes, the high clean fleece weight, low clean fleece weight mobs, ran them through, and there's generally, there's a couple of little exceptions, but generally they run at that 10 or 15% sort of difference. So it just backs up that sort of negative correlation. Um, when you get a Nuffield scholarship sponsored by AWI looking at sheep and you're an Australian, it's a little bit of a challenge to go overseas and find something new and bring it, bring it back. At the time, 
The sheep CRC was in full flight. Genomics was about to come on board. Like all the really interesting stuff in the sheep world was happening kind of here. So um, I went and looked at a lot of other species and just got a lot of grounded knowledge in breeding and concepts. And one of the places, and it was one of the best places I went, was the, in Holland, the New Holland uh, Genetics, an unbelievably long-running, performance-based dairy breeding scheme. It's been going for 40 or 50 years, ever since blood technology and breeding and breeding values have been available and things. Um, I had a very interesting uh, conversation with their main geneticist there. That red line there is, is production, so to speak, sort of highlighted as kilograms of protein, so volume and the amount of protein in that milk that they're getting out of their dairy cow. And obviously that, like wool cut per head or whatever, was a big part of their index. That's something that drives the profitability of a dairy herd anywhere in the world, but certainly in Holland. Now, it was interesting that during that period of that focusing on that production, the um, fertility level mirrored it virtually, but going downwards. And that's a little bit scary, you know. And it wasn't as dramatic as, dramatic as this when you actually look at, the, um, look at the scale and where it got to. But I like to say it got to the stage there in about 2000 that they had the most unbelievably genetic dairy cows that have ever been on the face of the earth. They just couldn't get them pregnant. And I'm not expert in dairy, but I think they need to get pregnant and lactate before they can get any milk. So they had these extreme genetics that were really struggling to get pregnant. And, and there's a lot of cases, the Angora goats, with the, um, trying to drive that micron down really, really low, same deal. So any single sort of trait is a bit of a problem. The really good news here, in 2000, they realised they had a problem. They just readjusted the levers in their breeding program and things, and it, and it started going up pretty straight. I'd love to get an updated um, thing there. I've emailed this guy a couple of times to try and get an update to where he is, but I've never sort of got a response. Uh, but the real joy of that, they managed to stop that trend, but if you look at the production, they didn't have to give anything up. That, that, that stayed up as a uh, pretty high level. So I guess the South Africans, when I went there, I learned they had a price signal for meat a lot before we did in Australia, and they really changed things around differently. And they were really aware of this sort of inverse relationship between greasy fleece weight and number of lambs weaned. And so their solution was, let's just take the wool away, which is the Doonies and Sams and stuff. And this is not a, a breed comparison, whatever. But, and they'll tell you happily that there's, they, one of their attributes is they cut less wool for this exact reason. I just didn't think the Australian merino industry would ever buy that sort of concept and things. So it was just really good for me to know there is a way. You can just need to read through the thing. You don't have to give up on the production, in this case, the wool cut, that it's 150 years of hard work and sort of none. Um, OK, those four pillars. I'm just going to really briefly hit those sort of things and some innovation that we think we're doing. Um, so in 2007, all I want to do with these graphs here, don't read too much into them. Um, I was hoping Jason might have mentioned a little bit more, but fat, growth and muscle are, are, are traits that are really important in this maternal space and for a lot of things, for your protein and your meat and whatnot. So I'd just like to show how powerful genetics can be in the sense that in 2007, I did my nut field, I learned this, I rejigged, I came home, and I started putting a lot of pressure on those traits in the breeding objectives. And it's just to highlight you know, the genetic trends that we've been managing to achieve since then. And there's that eye muscle. It's, uh, that's a merino, 10-month-old sort of merino thing. And, and it happens. And if you select for something, you will get it. It just, it just works. And it's just this debate about um, oh, the sheep industry and somehow she's different than every other species on the planet and blup doesn't work with her. It's just I don't really understand where that comes from because it just works. And we had a worker, actually, and we were killing the first time we killed a sheep for the house. It was part of his deal and didn't he eat? Every about week he told me it was time to go and kill a few more lambs. It was part of his package. But the very first time we did it, we were just cutting them up, and he just went, look at these chops. And because this had been a gradual process for me, and I didn't really realise, oh, you, you kind of just accept this as the way our sort of chops were. Um, he just said that eye muscle and the loin and the thing, it's just really quite extraordinary. So it was just an observation. But so it, it does work, funny enough. So those sort of great things are being achieved by ASBVs. We've got sheep genetics. We're the envy of the world, having that resource there, and now genomics to sort of add a bit of accuracy in things. I said I wasn't going to talk too much about those specifics, but fat's one that's dear to my heart. And uh, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on that, because it, to me it's a bit of keen. It ties in very, very nicely with what Jason was saying. Um, so some research done in 1994 by Dove and others found that milk production was influenced by body reserves fat in the ewe at lambing. Now, if there's any press here, stop the press. Front page news. Look at that. That is unbelievable. What a great scientific discovery that was. Good condition in that helps the ewe produce um, body reserves in the ewe for uh, milk production. 
that paper that um, I showed before, Hatcher and Atkins, they found that, and Jason certainly alluded to this, that the high clean flows weren't used. The problem wasn't getting pregnant. It wasn't their fertility. It was lamb survival. So the only real difference, the joining rates between those two lot of ewes in that thing were very similar, but we had the problems with those, those lamb losses. They also found, when they started to sort of strip that back a little bit, that those higher clean fleece weight ewes tended to have a lower metabolic energy status and body fatness. So there was that bit of competition, that was the, 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 the energy was being partitioned towards the, to, towards the fleece maybe a little bit more or something, so they were running at a lower um, body fatness lower metabolic energy status, that's important for milk production, these lambs were dying. Like, it's a pretty simple jigsaw puzzle to put together when the pieces start, start falling to piece, into things. So another way this happened was a, um, and a really old guy in South Africa sort of did all of that in a very simple thing. He just said, Andrew, if you're going to know anything about this stuff, you've got to understand one thing when you breed sheep, particularly in Merinos with a wool component, Wool production and lamb survivals are competitors, literally competing on that new nutrition, and so is their own survival. So that was a bit of a light bulb moment, and I sort of approached things like that afterwards. What's it mean commercially? Um, this was an indirect sort of thing, this fat, and it really comes back to Jason, and the, oh, I really strongly believe there's another component that light lifetime you doesn't quite go into yet. Um, it's not just the feed available and where she's at to and what's the condition score, and this is the sort of genetic influence that you can have. This was a experiment that was done by default basically after the thing. When your wardry started, I'm glad that they've dispersed because it doesn't make this so um, difficult to put up. But um, I bought uh, with my class of suggestions, 80 class in use, what a great opportunity, South Australian, big, big framed and everything used and good outcross and classed in and all the rest of it. And I got them and brought them home against my better judgment because they weren't performance tested so I should have known better but anyway, I brought them home. And after three months of putting them in biosecurity to make sure that everything was right, health and everything else, they just went dispersed through our flock and ran and that. And we condition score four times a year. Um, lambing, weaning, prior to lambing, weaning, joining and things. And so I thought, oh, what I've actually done here is an experiment. This was after the years had well and truly begun. I only joined them for two years and then got rid of the things. Um, but I thought, well, I've got that data. I just need to break up those two subsets. What does actually using a breeding value for P fat and Y fat actually mean to the um, commercial thing with regards to all the stuff Jason was talking about with regards to the condition score? And it's virtually one condition score. It would be. The only difference where they sort of converge a little bit at the end there, that's because they dropped under what I think is an optimum level coming into lambing of sort of around 3.2. So they only converged there because I had to take them off, manage them different, bring out the feed cart, feed them barley, and so they actually came back up a bit closer there. So on a scale of one to five, you know, that, that, that's a big difference. And that's a free kick. They, they just sort of track a bit better there. So that's pretty nice. Uh, the second one, um, phenotype. After last night, everyone will probably relate to this bottle of wine. Um, phenotype's dead set important. And I used to be quite a, a knocker of the show scene, and I don't really mind it because they're anymore. It's not my cup of tea, but it's a place where the animals can be certainly assessed and structured and things like that. But, when you compare it to a bottle of wine, the bottle of wine itself has got a huge part to play. It's got a, just the vessel. It has to get from the vineyard to the retail store. It's got to have a label so the consumer can say, well, what's in it? It's got to be corked, or now it's a, it's a screw top to make it sealed so the wine doesn't go off like it's got a really, really important functional role to play. Once it ticks all those boxes, um, like the sheep, they need to be structurally sound for rams, test the three T's, testy toes and teeth, you know, they just seems that are really, really basic. But once you've ticked that off, I'm pretty sure most people here that are like drinking wine, what you're really interested in is what's inside that bottle. So you tick off that functionality role that has to be played and you, um, you, you, you go to the source, which is the genetics. And it's exactly the same with the sheep. There is some innovation to be done. The horns have to go, the horns have to go, the wrinkles have to go. Um, cleaning up their faces a little bit for grass seeds has got all sorts of correlations with these sort of traits with lamb survival and things. I think it's what is adjacent, eight or 10% for every condition score of wrinkle you knock off them or something along those lines. It's, it's pretty significant. Um, so that's where we see it. And it doesn't matter if you buy the best bottle of Grange Hermitage, if it's been corked or something, you'll have a big investment but you'll be disappointed when it comes to drinking that wine. So once you get those things right, it's really, really important. 
And I, I just say, and it's, it sounds a little silly, but it's really enlightenment. It's just an understanding that, look at the animal, sure, it has to tick all the boxes. It's got to be functional, but once it's done, don't spend too much time and energy and reserves on, on, on all of that stuff, because it's really the genetics that will go forward and create that ewe flock that Jason's talking about. Uh, innovating management, I can run through these pretty quickly. Uh, how about this one? Mixed farming in a land is land use. I live at Lockhart, Google sheep wheat belt. You'll see a nice big banana shaped thing going from sort of Queensland right through Lockhart, through Victoria to the South Australia. I'm fairly in the middle of it and there's a lot of people shifting to 100% cropping. So um, to think that maybe the concept of a mixed farming um, arrangement in the middle of the sheep wheat belt is an innovative idea is something that's a little ironic but there, there's a bit of truth to it. Um, improved pastures, Jason obviously talked again about the importance of turning rainfall into dry matter grass and then into those products. Um, with climate change, climate variability, climate whatever it is, we're getting a lot more summer rains. I, we, one of the uh, presentations I went to, and I'd seen it before, but that tropical things coming further south and things like that, so we get big rain events. So I've really given up on that old fashioned pasture curve situation. To be honest, I think it's, it's, it's a very dangerous thing in this day and age to put it up there, but it, we, any time of the year with the loosened and improved pastures, with the wedge tail wheat grazing crops, that winter feed gap that used to really exist in winter with the use of wedge tail uh, as, a, as a crop, that's now my highest stocking rate period is the middle of winter where traditionally that's been when you should have carried the loose stock because you can just pile them on there. So it's just all these management sort of things that need to be done. Certainly educate yourself, do the lifetime new thing that Jason talked about, get yourself in one of those courses, just things like that. Adapt, adopting technology, uh, we're early adopters and that hasn't really always been a smart idea with regards to electronic tags and trying to get all the different systems that talk. It's um, just about driven me insane at times, but we've got there now. But just that importance of the preg testing, the importance for me to scan, to know that fat and muscle so I can pick the animals that are going to take me forward if those traits are important. Just that measuring and whatever and embracing genomics, it's just pretty important. And the other one I've done is um, changing management is six months shearing. I could do a whole hour presentation on that alone. It is extraordinary. That is the biggest signal thing. That and probably the wedge tail weed are the two biggest management things that I've done to change this um, situation. And it's why those four pillars intertwine so much. Because I can't do this if I didn't have that genetic base. And I put a lot of emphasis on staple length. I've got rid of the wrinkle. I didn't want to lose wool cut. I'm filling up bales with length of staple as opposed to density now. But I needed to do that because you want to aim at 60 mils twice a year. You know That's your really a minimum. We've been lucky enough to get up to 60 nine in some six month periods and things with, with good seasons in our flavour and things, but yeah, these things aren't independent. I could have introduced this management tool without that genetic component to be able to get me there. Um, environmental in innovation, it's just really, ex there, there, there's two parts to this here. I think there is a lot of innovation given this climate change thing and what I'm talking about with that condition score thing is my own little haymaking. I still obviously make hay and conserve fodder because it's you'll farm in the driest continent on the planet, so you've got to have a bit of a, bit of a um, safety net there. But what I really like about this is those years you saw in that graph with that condition score, they always travel a little bit better. So when things are good, like those wedge tail wheat crops, or if we get seven inches of rain in December, which used to be just rubbish and just everyone would be complaining because you'd have to bring out the boom spray, now that can set up and they'll harvest that themselves, which saves me the cost and expense of making that hay and doing anything else, stick it on their back very quickly, and then you harvest it back later on. And when you're harvesting that back, you're making money because you're not spending grain to fill up that feed gap and that it really is a, a powerful thing. So yeah, the environment's changing. You've got to be innovating and changed with it. And just you have to really respect um, the constraints under the environment, uh, of the environment. This was in the Falkland Islands. Once again, I was only in Nuffield. I ended up in the Falkland Islands, which is a fascinating place. And the, the little lambs there on your left were the new build things that were going to save the Falkland Island sheep flock. They were some doonies. They were, came in the form of embryos, so they came straight via South Africa to Western Australia to the Falkland Islands, the toughest place in the world that I've ever seen to try and run sheep. It is just miserable. So they brought these in. The ones on the right were their sort of corridor, comeback -y type of sheep with their natural things. They actually ai uh, they dropped those embryos right in the middle of their natural joining so they could get a decent comparison. So it was just no respect basically for the environment. Those doonies just did not do. They're born in the Mediterranean, semi, 
sort of warm climates and things like that, they were picked up as embryos, chucked in there as the new butte saved the day, and they didn't grow and they were miserable and they just didn't. And I said, really, these are the sheep that are going to take you forward? So that environmental in, uh, understanding is pretty important. So really, what's it all mean? And Jason's been through that, but you know, you're really going to get Weaning percentage has gone up, not just for myself, for clients, and we're just seeing it, and, and that's ethical. That Jason didn't touch on it, but you know those lambs that are dying, if we think milsing's an issue for the sheep industry, if, if that 2,000 dead, 2,600 lambs or whatever it is, out of 5,000 ewes, really became a well-known world type of a situation, that would be a massive problem, obviously. So it's a, it's a good ethical way to operate. You get selection pressure, you get increased sales, the ewe mortality at home with the six-month shearing and that genetic buffer really, really is just about put our ewe mortality to zero, uh, particularly since we don't carry the older ewes because we've got better lambing percentages and younger ewes coming through, so we sell them on as brooders for pretty handy money. Your costs are down, that, that feed cart, your management, your labour, because they're easy care, pole, less fly strike, all those things are obviously down. You've got increased options. Uh, they've got the growth and things that you can get the ewe lambs up to a joining weight. Uh, it's sort of seven months, so you join your ewe lambs or join every three years, turning off heavier lambs. These are just little free kicks you get along the way. You, you do this to make your maternal ewe better by putting emphasis on growth rates, and all of a sudden you weather lambs are, are going off two months earlier, which means you've got better stocking rates and all the rest of it. So you know, I'll, I'll, that's my last slide, which is that first one. You know, it just really sums it up. There's those four pillars. There's a huge scope to make small changes and big changes and innovate in all those four areas. And, and you need to have that understanding of that relationship between production and fitness. But yes, the Marina U has got a very viable future. She is absolutely a cash cow. And I tell you, get on board because she is a very profitable, useful unit. Thank you.